my name is Murray Hebert. I work on the uh, Southeast Asia chair here at uh, CSIS. And on behalf of CSIS, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you here to our brand new building. Uh, we've only been in here a month, so we're still in the process of breaking it in. So thank you for helping us. Uh, this is an event on, on uh, discussing the health situation in the Philippines. Uh, this is co-sponsored by the U.S. Philippine Society, the Embassy of the Philippines, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Center for Communication Programs, and done in cooperation with the Philippines Department of Health and the Zulig Family Foundation. Just mention that this uh, program is being uh, webcast through the CSIS website, and the Twitter information is at Southeast Asia DC, uh, at, or at CSIS, or hash mark CSIS live. Now we're, do, we're holding this meeting, it was planned a long time ago. We were holding it at a time of great tragedy in the Philippines. We wanna uh, hold the families and, and people who are suffering immensely in the central Philippines in our prayers. Um, and there's uh, lots of opportunities for, for donating. Uh, you can, U.S. Uh, Philippine Society has information. We also put out some yesterday. Uh, the American Red Cross and, and World Food Program, lots and a lot of the NGOs are, are taking donations. Uh, my job here is very simple. I'm, I'm, I've now performed it, except for turning over the program to Ambassador John Manjo. Uh, Monsieur, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Welcome, everybody. Uh, of course, we know it's time for reflection on the impact of the super typhoon Yolanda that struck the central Philippines last week. Uh, those affected included village clinics recently established to provide maternal health services to the rural poor. And you will hear about this this afternoon because that's what the Zulig Foundation is all about. Now, to extend an official welcome on behalf of the U.S. Philippine Society, we have Ambassador John Negroponte, the Society's co-chair. And following Ambassador Negroponte, Mr. William Glass, Director for uh, Strategic Communications of the Center of, for Communications Programs of the Johns Hopkins University's Bloomberg School of Public Health will join us. But Ambassador Negroponte. Thank you, uh, Ambassador uh, Maisto. Uh, good morning to Secretary Ona, who is joining us from Manila, and I hope he hears this greeting. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Cabral, Ambassador Romulo, Ambassador Quisia, Professor Gary Lau, Mr. Zulig, Daniel Zulig, Mr. Hebert, representatives uh, from John's Johns Hopkins, colleagues and other distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, welcome on behalf of the United States Philippines Society. Uh, Super Typhoon uh, Haiyan, or Yolanda as it is known in the Philippines, struck the central Philippines last week with heartbreaking effect. The Philippine government International and local relief organizations and the international community have launched a massive effort to provide shelter, clean water, food, and medicine. Over nine million people are affected, with hundreds of thousands in evacuation centers. Reported casualty numbers are growing as communications are reestablished with rural areas. This is one of the strongest tropical cyclones to hit land in history, and, it is and its terrifying effects are displayed daily around the world on television and in newspapers. We in the U.S. Philippine Society encourage you to assist by spreading the word about how to provide help. You are health experts, an area of critical need. We have joined with our Philippine partners and co-sponsors of this afternoon's health forum to address public health needs in the affected areas where some 70,000 households have been impacted. Our immediate initiative involves an appeal for funding to supply relief kits costing $40. Each kit provides basic supplies to support a family for five days. 
Let me direct you to the back page of today's program for details on how to contribute. This information is also found on our society's webpage. Our intention to help provide community sustainability first, then to move on to restore health programs so sorely needed over the longer term. You will hear more about those programs this afternoon. So thank you very much uh, for your support and concern, and thank you very much for joining us at this important conference this afternoon. Thank you. Afternoon, everybody. Representatives of the U.S. Philippine Society, the Philippines Embassy, the Zulig Family Foundation, and the Department of Health of the Government of the Philippines, panelists and commentators from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, George Washington, and my own colleagues from Johns Hopkins, as well as our private sector collaborators in the audience. Given the destruction in the Philippines in the past month with the earthquake and now the typhoon, it's a challenge for those of us at the Center for Communication Programs to focus on longer term development challenges there, such as addressing maternal health. But if even those who are on the front lines responding to these disasters in the Philippines are joining us here today, we can do nothing less than offer them our messages of solidarity not only in these challenging days of crisis response, but in their long-term efforts to create an enabling environment for sustainable change in key health indicators. We heard overnight that one of our own workshops that was taking place in the Philippines, more than half of the participants can't return home to their, to their hometowns and families. So we're uh, getting some sense of the, the effects ourselves from our colleagues in country. Despite the destruction brought about by Yolanda or Hayan, we know that the Filipino spirit of Bayanihan will prevail and that out of this crucible will rise stronger and more productive communities. We at the center feel a kinship with the work of the Zelig Foundation and the Department of Health in the Philippines. We all understand that key levers of transformative change in the health sector rest beyond the walls of clinics and in the hands of visionary local leaders and enlightened families. For the past 30 years, we at the center have pursued with passion our belief that putting information in the hands of these actors can trigger broad social movements that move health indicators, and that addressing societal change is a necessary complement to what happens in clinics. Families are producers of health, and inspired local leaders can remove obstacles in their path. In our work in over 30 countries around the world managing 70 grants and contracts, we focus on strategic health communication, programs that are systematic, evidence-based, participatory, and capacity strengthening. I'll just mention very briefly three examples of this work. In Pakistan, we've worked with our partners uh, to mobilize all sectors of society ulamas, men and women, service providers, politicians, and the creative classes to take on entrenched maternal, neonatal, and child health norms. The combined effect has led to increased knowledge of maternal, neonatal, and child health issues and better health outcomes. One of that program's shining uh, examples of the work was a full-length feature film, Bowl. It not only spurred national and international dialogue around gender roles and family planning and maternal health issues, it also grossed more at the box office than any other movie in Pakistani history. It's had an impact on national policy as well. There, the National Assembly and Senate have unanimously passed two pro-women pro bills aimed at protecting women from negative, negative customs and traditions that seek to severe punish and seek severe punishments for violators. The second example I'll share with you is from Ghana, our Good Life campaign. They're working with the National Health Service and the Ministry of Health. The theme of that is life is what you make it. 
And there, a popular game show, concerts, TV spots, mini docudramas, and an army of outreach agents at the local level are working to transform norms. The third example I'll give you is from South Africa, where our team has been battling the HIV epidemic for 15 years. Their work regularly wins national and international awards and has swept the South African equivalent of the Emmys for two years running and tops the ratings on national TV. Our team's latest, as they call it, adventure in South Africa is Zazi, a new campaign aimed at women and girls that launched this past May. It encourages women and girls to draw on their inner strength, power, and self-confidence to know themselves and what they stand for in order to guide their decisions about the future. I bring up these examples to let you know that our approach to the work resonates quite well with the Zelig's Foundation approach to the work of getting outside of the walls of clinics and outside of the normal health system and trying to inspire broad social change across a wide swath of society. As a body of work, these programs, as well as the efforts of the government and NGOs in the Philippines, demonstrate that effective health systems require much more than clinics and hospitals. They require enlightened leadership, mobilized communities, and most importantly, empowered families. We're confident that just as the bamboo bends with the wind, the Filipino people will join hands with help and admiration from the international community to forge a more resolute nation committed to the welfare and health of its people. We're proud to be associated with today's event and we look forward to today's discussions. Thank you. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Ambassador Jose Cuisia, Jr the Ambassador of the Republic of the Philippines to the United States to introduce uh, our speaker from Manila, uh, the Secretary of Health, uh, Dr. Nikiona. Ambassador Quisi. Good morning to Dr. Enrico Ona in Manila. And good afternoon to all our distinguished personalities, uh, speakers, and participants. I've been asked to introduce uh, Dr. Ona, our guest speaker. But before I do so, let me take this opportunity to express my appreciation um, to the words or expressions of concern, sympathy, and support for the victims, as well as families of the victims of the super typhoon Haiyan, more popularly known in the Philippines as Typhoon Yolanda. We wish to thank our American friends and the U.S. government, um, particularly because it was the U.S. government that was the, among the first to respond to the appeal for assistance when they dispatched uh, C-130 aircraft filled with relief supplies as well as Osprey aircraft together with uh, 180 Marines who were sent immediately to the Philippines to assist in the rescue and relief uh, efforts. Um, just two days ago, uh, Secretary Hagel dispatched the aircraft carrier USS George Washington together with its uh, useful convoy, which includes a supply ship and a medical ship that will assist in the um, rescue and relief efforts. Uh, as you know, the carrier also has quite a number of uh, helicopters and other aircraft that would be useful in disaster relief uh, and humanitarian, assist humanitarian assistance efforts. So we thank the U.S. government and also the American people for their very generous support. <clears throat> Secretary Ona had to stay in the Philippines to focus on efforts to respond to the devastating effects of Typhoon Haiyan, or as I said, in the Philippines, it's known as 
Typhoon Yolanda. However, he's joining us by video radio conference to bring the message directly to us. Our guest speaker is recognized as one of the top surgeons of the country, specializing in the field of vascular and transplant surgery. A graduate of the University of the Philippines, he underwent surgical training in the United States and United Kingdom. He is certified by both the Philippine and American Board of Surgery. Upon his return to the country, he joined the faculty of the University of the Philippines and the Philippine General Hospital. He was professor and vice chair of the Department of Surgery when he was tapped to become the executive director of the National Kidney and Transplant Institute, or NKTI, transforming the said institute into the first ISO certified government hospital in the Philippines. Under his leadership, NKTI was recognized as a world-class center of kidney transplantation. He performed the first multi-organ transplants in Southeast Asia, a combined liver and kidney transplant and a combined kidney and pancreas transplant at the National Kidney Transplant Institute. I was privileged to work with Dr. Onam on the board of uh, Philam Care, the largest HMO in the Philippines at that time. This uh, HMO was jointly owned by AIG and United Healthcare. His experience as an expert medical practitioner enriched board deliberations and contributed to the success of the firm. He is a recipient of numerous national and international awards, such as the 10 Outstanding Young Men, or TOYM Award in Medicine, 1979, the Most Outstanding Alumnus of the College of Medicine, and Most Distinguished Alumnus of the University of the Philippines. Is also the first and only Filipino surgeon to be awarded the Honorary Fellowship of the American College of Surgeons, or ACS, in 2012, a singular honor for one who is already a fellow of the ACS. As Secretary of Health, he has devoted himself relentlessly to the mission of attaining Kalusugan Pangkalahatan, or universal health care for Filipinos, responding to the challenge of His Excellency President Benigno Aquino III. In his first year, 5.3 million Filipinos, or about 25 million Filipinos, have been enrolled in PhilHealth. In PhilHealth. <clears throat> during, his, during this term, two landmark health reforms have been passed after nearly two decades and five Congresses, namely the Responsible Parenthood and Reproductive Health Care, or Health Act of 2012, which by the way, Dr. Esperanza Cabral was also very much responsible for, and the Tobacco and Alcohol Excise Tax Reform of 2012. The latter will make it possible to increase the total subsidy for the poor Filipino families thereby allowing them to increase field health enrollment from 5.3 million families to 14.7 million families, or about 45 to 50 million Filipinos starting January 2014. Also just recently, the amendment to the field health law was passed to making coverage compulsory for all Filipinos. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to present our guests of honor, Health Secretary, health Secretary Dr. Enrique T. Ona. Thank you.
public health efforts fell short of Millennium Develop with goals for 2018, especially those related to maternal health. As you can see, it appears that the Philippines will not be able to achieve the MDG target 52 maternal deaths for every 100,000 live births. Nothing is done on this. Furthermore, our hospitals are congested and most medical equipment were either outmoded or non-functional. For nearly two decades, the hospital stayed as they were since they were constructed and did not expand in response to a growing population. What we have is a hospital bed to population ratio that has stagnated for the past three decades. To compound the health infrastructure gap, population growth only made matters less manageable. The fertility rate of the Philippines is among the highest in East Asia an average of 3.1 births per woman of fertile age, especially among the very poor. Our program of universal health care, therefore, three tasks, among which are to achieve medium development goals by 2015, providing financial risk protection for the high cost of catastrophic or serious illnesses, and securing access to quality care at all levels. And the three trusts are being implemented in a continuum of interventions of primary prevention and health promotion, secondary prevention and primary care, and curative health. This is our roadmap to universal health care. First is the achievement of public health millennium development goals, the strategies such as the reduction of maternal and child mortality, control and elimination of infectious diseases, and the promotion of healthy lifestyles. Second is financial risk protection through the expansion of field health coverage. Third is accessibility of quality care delivery system. And lastly is the improvement of health governance with the strategies of health system development and the maintenance of an effective health regulatory system. As of today, we have accomplished the following. 80% of our children are now fully immunized. 57% of women have delivered in health facilities compared to only 38.8% in 2009. In terms of reproductive health, 2.1 million women of reproductive age were provided with modern family planning commodities last year. And finally, despite significant opposition from various sectors, finally achieved a legislative victory the passage of the Responsible Parenthood and Reproductive Health Act on December 21, 2012. From childbirth from 221 to 50 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. Our strategy is to increase further facility-based deliveries. Another key accomplishment is the control of infectious diseases, including HIV AIDS, malaria, psoriasis, and others. We have been able to improve the national enrollment rate of field health. This includes 5.2 million poor households of about 20 to 25 million beneficiaries who receive 100% government subsidy their health insurance premium, which started in 2011. From a legislative standpoint, the syntax reform law was signed in December of last year in spite of strong opposition from the tobacco industry. It is estimated that the revenues from the syntax is projected to generate U.S. $674 million this year 
and up to U.S. $1.25 billion by 2017. 85% of this new source of revenues will be allocated to support universal health care. To enhance financial risk protection, the following benefit packages were institutionalized. This included the no balance billing policy in September of 2011 from the sponsored program beneficiaries and admitted in a government health facility. The case rate package was adopted a year ago for 23 common diseases, which marked the transition from the traditional fee for service to a case rate payment system. To address diseases which drives families to poverty, the Z benefit package was launched in July of last year. This package included full coverage for breast cancer, prostate cancer, leukemia, and kidney transplantation. We also initiated enrollment at the point of care which means that poor patients who were not previously identified as poor may be admitted in government hospitals and entitled to the no balance billing policy. The most visible accomplishment of the Department of Health, the Health Facilities Enhancement Program, which upgraded 1,567 Marangay Health Station, 1,642 rural health units, and 266 local government hospitals since 2010. The Department of Health also upgraded 60 of our national hospitals. Shown here is a small health facility, Rangai Health Station, which serves about 3 to 5,000 people. This is usually manned by a midwife or a nurse. This is a facility tasked with delivery of public health services and primary prevention and health promotive services. This is a photo of a rural health unit which serves several barangays or even one whole town and is better staffed and more equipped than a barangay health station. It has a full-time physician, nurses, a midwife, a medical technologist, a sanitary inspector, and even a dentist. Shown is a rural health unit of a third class municipality in the province of Antique with a population of about 30,000. This picture is a district hospital which will be a 15 to 30 bed hospital which serves a population of as much as 100,000 people. It has doctors, nurses, and other complementary health personnel. This is a picture of a typical Department of Health hospital with 200 beds or more and serves as the end referral center in a province or a region. To bridge the infrastructure gap, is the provision of doctors, nurses, and other health personnel to this health facility. We have deployed 204 physicians under the Doctors to the Barriers program, 81,952 nurses under the RN Heals program, and 2,738 midwives, and 40,850 one community, the community health teams composed of five members, which includes a nurse, a midwife, as a leader that, of the team that is being deployed. We are indeed proud of our doctors of the Barrios program. Shown here on the left is a physician doing a house call in a remote village doing preventive and curative care. And the other side shows a doctor giving a public health lecture to an inland community. This year, 22,500 nurses were deployed as part of our registered nurse 
for health enhancement and local service program. Last July 2012, the Department of Health became the first cabinet department to be fully ISO certified, covering both central and regional offices. It has increased its satisfaction rating from good plus 37, plus 37 in 2009 to very good plus 60 in the latest social weather station survey of last year. In terms of information technology, we have also partially launched a national telehealth service program through the wireless access for health, connecting our rural health units to the national health information network. For the first time, of health has formally partnered with the private sector, in particular, our program of, le of leadership and health governance with the Swelling Family Foundation which will also be presented in this forum today. Other PPPs, or public-private partnerships, are being initiated into our major Department of Health Hospital. The targets by 2016 are to decrease maternal mortality rates of women dying from childbirth, to decrease under five years mortality, to decrease the prevalence of tuberculosis, to decrease patients get, getting malaria, and maintain the low HIV AIDS prevalence and control its growth. In terms of quality health services, we will complete upgrading and construction of health facilities. We will modernize our equipment and sustain the availability of health human resources and access to drugs and to minimize financial risk, we will also enroll and cover 90% of Filipinos with social health insurance and intend to increase the support value of our health insurance claims. The Department of Health Roadmap Budget shows our commi the commitment of President Aquino for more investments for health. The budget production shown shows an increasing trend, primary and secondary prevention from 2010 to 2016. However, the Philippines faces unique challenges and gaps, which include, among others, difficulty to synchronize public health in the world augmented health system. The challenge of bringing health care in geographically isolated areas that involve isolation from medical care and being in conflict areas. Of enrolling a rapid health insurance coverage to about 40 million Filipinos through our national subsidy or half of the population in three years' time is indeed daunting. We need to reform the governance of public hospitals to make them sustainable financially and not to rely on government subsidy indefinitely. There is a challenge to improve timeliness and accuracy of national data gathering, such as our vital civil registries. There is also resistance to public-private partnerships owing to the misunderstanding of the nature of the relationship by the public and opposition from some interest groups. Lastly, the Philippines is within the Pacific Ring of Fire and subject to earthquakes and an average of 20 typhoons every year, making it among the most disaster-prone countries in the world. With the most recent one four days ago, the Typhoon Heidi One, or Yolanda locally, which is considered the most devastating in terms of speed, making seven landfalls at 330 to 375 kilometers per hour.
consequence of all these natural and man-made disasters lead to destruction of health facilities such that we usually end up repairing or even rebuilding another health facility. This slide shows what happened in Bohol in October 15, 2013 with a 7.2 magnitude earthquake that killed more than 200 people and around 597,000 families were affected from six provinces and cities. The earthquake damaged 57,950 houses, 22 hospitals, and 65 other health facilities. This current Typhoon Yolanda that struck the Philippines four days ago has affected an estimated 2 million families or about 9.6 million people in all 41 provinces in the central islands of the Philippines. About 615,774 people are displaced and over 433,000 are staying currently inside evacuation centers. The powerful wind of the typhoon, which was considered to be as strong as a Category 5 hurricane, three times the power of Hurricane Katrina at, 700, at 375 kilometers per hour in considered the most powerful typhoon ever recorded in world history and has devastated areas along the central Philippines. On December 16 of 2011, this picture shows Typhoon Sendong, their national name Tropical Storm Washi, which wreaked havoc on the island of Mindanao. The death toll was 1,249, with almost 5,000 injured and 12,000 houses damaged. It is the second highest death toll in Mindanao in 35 years. And apart from natural disasters, man-made disasters such as internal conflict, damage health facilities, and creates the potential outbreaks in our evacuation areas. Two and, a half, two and a half months ago, armed followers of Islamic leader entered the southern city of Zamboanga. The siege, which was a result of armed rebellion against the peace process agreement between the Muslim Islamic, between the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and the Philippine government, this place. 8,314 families in 27 evacuation center. As a matter of fact, an adjacent government hospital was used as a military staging ground, resulting in insignificant damage to our hospital. On December of last year, Eastern Mindanao was battered by Typhoon Pablo. More than 1,000 people lost their lives and many more were injured was also a Category 5 typhoon, means reaching as fast as 175 kilometers per hour. Many health facilities were destroyed, such as this one. There will be more challenges for the Department of Health, but I would like the private sector to partner more with us in the department. Such forms of PPPs are not driven by profit, but a desire to assist government in our effort to achieve universal health care. On behalf, therefore, of the President of the Philippines, and on a personal note as Secretary of Health, I would like to thank the international community for the spontaneous and, tre and tremendous outpouring of support and assistance in response to our current crisis. Give, I ask you to continually support us and for the support that you are giving us, I again say thank you and mabuhay.
We had planned to have some interaction, cannot do it for technical reasons, but the PowerPoint that the Secretary wanted to accompany this presentation will be on the CSIS website between 24 and 48 hours, and it will flesh out uh, what you just heard. Um, so thank you, Secretary Ona, for that presentation. And now we turn to the challenges of reproductive health. And for this, we have Dr. Esperanza Cabral, the former Secretary of the Department of Health, currently a trustee of the Zulig Family Foundation and Senior Program and Policy Advisor of the United Nations Population Fund. We are indeed privileged to have Dr. Cabral here with us today. Thank you very much, Ambassador Maestro. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends, it is my pleasure to join you at this uh, forum on public health in the Philippines, progress and challenges. I wish we could be meeting under less tragic circumstances, but I think it will serve to emphasize the challenges um, of health in general and reproductive health in particular that we have in the Philippines. Thank you. This morning, I would like to discuss with you the state of reproductive health in the Philippines, as well as the challenges of reproductive health in the country. Just briefly, we are talking about a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity in all matters related to the reproductive system and to its functions and processes. In the Philippines, women and young people face huge social and economic bar barriers to reproductive health. Three million couples do not have access to family planning services, and over 5,000 women die from complications of pregnancy and childbirth each year. That comes to 14 mothers every day. Over 33,000 children die in the first month of life. Over 15,000 cases of HIV AIDS have been reported since 1984. And reproductive health problems account for 20% of the burden of health among women of reproductive health and 14% for men. In our country, there are 10.5 million women of reproductive age. 5.9 million of these are at risk of pregnancy at any given time. 3.37 million pregnancies result from this. Out of these 3.37 million pregnancies, 1.82 million are unintended and 90% occur in women using no or traditional methods of contraception. For example, natural family planning. Out of the 3.37 million pregnancies, 2.25 million births occur. Almost one million of these are unwanted or mistimed. Clearly, unintended pregnancy is a major public health problem that affects not just individuals, but the whole of Philippine society. Having babies is not necessarily more fun in the Philippines. We direct our attention to two of the Millennium Development Goals this afternoon, and these are MDG goal number four and number five, which are reducing child mortality and improving maternal health. Under five mortality in the Philippines is improving, and we are 
scheduled to meet our MDG target of 26.7 per thousand live births under five mortality by 2015. We also are not doing so badly in infant mortality rate. And while infant mortality rates have plateaued in the last 10 years, we are probably also going to meet our MDG target of 19 per thousand live births by 2015. However, there is very little progress to speak of as far as MDG goal number five is concerned. And we are not likely to meet this particular goal. You can see that uh, as a baseline sometime in the 1990s, the maternal mortality ratio was 209 per 100,000 live births. And our target is to bring this down to about 52 per 100,000 live births by 2015. But in the last survey conducted in 2011, it was found that our maternal mortality ratio is about the same as it was in the 1990s. It is uh, currently at 222 per 100,000 live births. This is mostly due to the fact that uh, contraceptive prevalence rate and therefore unintended pregnancies that result in many complications and deaths for both mothers and infants is quite low. You can see that our prevalence rate for the use of modern methods of contraception is merely 34%. Natural family planning is uh, made use of by one out of 200 women of reproductive age. Even though for the past nine years during the Arroyo administration, this was the method of contraception that was advocated by the administration. This slide shows you the percent of currently married women with unmet needs for family planning by economic indicator. And you can see that the unmet need for family planning of poor women is much greater than the unmet need for family planning of rich women. This unmet need for family planning results in a rise in unintended pregnancy risk, which has been observed to rise from about 33% of unintended pregnancy risk to about 39%. But the averages tell only part of the story as far as reproductive health in the Philippines is concerned. The poor always have a difficulty accessing health services compared to the rich. This is not something that is new even in biblical times it has been like that. It was like that. So that Matthew says in general, for unto everyone that has shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Inequity is nowhere more evident than in reproductive health care. And this shows you some of the indicators of reproductive health in the Philippines. The actual fertility or births for, per women in her reproductive cycle is 3.3 children per woman. But if you divide people into wealth quintile, you can see that the 
actual fertility of women in the poorest quintile is 5.2 children, whereas it is 1.9 for the richest women. The wanted fertility is 3.1 among the poor and 1.6 children among the rich. Here you can see that there is an excess of about two children per woman if you belong to the poorest quintile, whereas the women in the richest quintile have exactly or even have exactly the same, have exactly the number of children that they want. The birth interval among women who are poor is shorter than it is among women who are rich. And more poor women have child, are childbearing at an early age than rich women. As we mentioned, contraceptive use is greater among rich women than among the poor, which results in a greater unmet need among poor married women of reproductive age, and by the way, also non-married women of reproductive age. But uh, I can tell you that it's very difficult to get data on unmarried women of reproductive age in the Philippines. They are an invisible group as far as government and society is concerned. Here are a few other reproductive health indicators by wealth quintile. The number of women who deliver their babies with skilled health personnel in attendance is much greater among the rich than it is among the poor. The same with the number of women who deliver in health facilities. The percentage of cesarean section also differs between the poor and the rich. You might recall that in general, about 10 to 15 percent of pregnancies need to be delivered by cesarean section. What you can see here is that uh, only 1.7 percent of deliveries among poor women is done by cesarean section, but 20.3% of all deliveries by rich women is done by cesarean section. The poor, whether they need a cesarean section or not, will generally not get it. The rich, whether they need a cesarean section or not, will get it. Of interest, particularly these days, when the rate of teenage pregnancy has been rising, is the percentage of young women who start childbearing. Among the poor, 44% 44, 44 of women have started childbearing between the ages of 15 to 24, and only 13% among the rich have started childbearing at the age between the ages of 15 and 24. I think that uh, we discussed this inequity in uh, fertility rate. Other consequences of poor women's inability to access modern family planning methods are about 800,000 unintended births. 560,000 abortions, 5,100 maternal deaths per year, and many other health, economic, and social costs. About a decade back, the government instituted its contracep contraceptive self-reliance strategy, and the national government obligated itself to act as guarantor of last resort, assuring that 
contraceptives remain available for current users who depend on donated supplies. This policy, of course, failed. And from 1998, when 0.1% of women used natural family planning methods, the use of natural family planning methods only increased to 0.5%, leave, leaving a lot of women with no means of family planning during those years. We know about the three-pronged strategy to prevent mothers and babies from dying, and these are planned families, facility-based delivery by skilled health personnel, and access to emergency obstetric and neonatal care. The government, all these years, have been trying to improve our facility-based delivery rate and the access to emergency obstetric and neonatal care. So there have been improvements in these things. However, there has been no improvement in maternal mortality. The reason being, we had not paid any attention or inadequate attention to family planning. When it comes to reproductive health, we don't know everything, but we know quite a bit. The bigger challenge is applying the solutions we already know to the problems at hand. The gap between what we know and what we do in the Philippines is fundamentally political. There is, at the moment, general ignorance on reproductive health issues. Poverty impacts a lot on reproductive health care and services. And a big part of the reason why we have a poor reproductive health profile is objections from the Catholic Church. In addition, and this will be discussed further by Secretary Garilao, there is poor leadership and governance, not just for reproductive health, but for health in general. We have weak health systems, weak development uh, activities. We implement our signed conventions very poorly. Our local chief executives and even national chief executives executives do not recognize that we have a major problem that puts us out of sync with development. And finally, our leaders are intimidated by the Catholic Church. Such that in some communities, there are ordinances that are passed banning contraceptives, except for natural family planning resulting in uh, an increase in the number of unintended pregnancies and births in these localities. One important thing that has occurred in our country is the final passage of the Reproductive Health and Responsible Parenthood Act. But it went through a 17-year struggle before it finally became a law. And uh, while we need to credit our legislators for, for, for pushing this thing for 17 years, even though the chances of passing it was very minimal, we need to credit our president at present, President Aquino, for finally getting the reproductive health bill passed into a law. The reproductive health bill is keynoted by the right to informed choice by the public and the duty of government to provide reproductive health information and services, particularly to the poor. Because as you can see, 
we don't need to take take care of the rich as far as reproductive health is concerned. They can take care of themselves. It is the poor who actually need reproductive health services and they are the ones who are deprived of it. The reproductive health bill, therefore, aimed to achieve good reproductive health outcomes equitably. There were many objections to the reproductive health bill, but basically it is because it is part of what is known as the death to the family bills in the Philippines. And death includes divorce, euthanasia, abortion, total population control, homosexuality, and same-sex marriage. My favorite philosopher said, those who in principle oppose birth control are either incapable of arithmetic or else in favor of war, pestilence, and famine as permanent features of human life. We, need, we needed to go through a lot of struggle just as Many other Catholic countries needed to go through this kind of struggle before finally getting some amount of empowerment for our women. And here are just a few pictures of uh, the people who advocated for reproductive health rights and services in the country. I was telling you that um, the Reproductive uh, Health Act was pushed primarily in, the, in Congress by three people, Congressman Edsel Lagman, Senator Pia Cayetano, and Senator Miriam Defensor Santiago. But finally, together with the public, that had an 80% approval rate for the reproductive health law, the president was able to pass this bill into a law. The reproductive health bill is rights-based, health-oriented, and sustainable development driven. It provides for all of these things and many others besides. But threats continue. There are, with the Supreme Court, 13 petitions against the law. And it went through three months of oral arguments that finished sometime in August. The petitioners and uh, on both sides were given 60 days, which ended on October 25, to file their final memoranda on the law. And now it is entirely up to the Supreme Court. Not only is the reproductive health law threatened in the Supreme Court, there are already anti-reproductive health bills refiled in the 13th Congress, and the budget for reproductive health services will always be a matter of negotiations. Apart from that, there are still very many areas in the Philippines where anti-reproductive health local government units have been influenced strongly by the Catholic Church. We, however, hope that uh, eventually the reproductive health law will be declared constitutional by the Supreme Court and we can move to its implementation. During which time, there will be many more challenges including education, adoption, implementation, and sustention of the activities related to reproductive health. Nobody can argue with this uh, slogan of every woman being empowered 
every pregnancy being safe and wanted and every child being provided for and loved. But still, we do face a lot of challenges that would deny reproductive health rights and the duty of the state to work for all as far as reproductive health is concerned. I only wish it gets easier the second time because uh, there will be not just the second time, there will be many other times we all have to fight for the reproductive health rights of Filipino women as well as women all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Cabral. And now we move to the open forum. And I would like at this moment to ask Ambassador Roberto Romulo, chairman of the Zulig Family Foundation, to come up to the stage, where he will be joined by our two panelists, Dr. Jav Rav uh, Rajiv Rimal, chair of prevention and public health of the George Washington University, and Ms. Ann Hershey, uh, who is a hands-on health official from the U.S. Agency for International Development who has just completed a four-year assignment in Manila, so she should know something of what she's doing. Thank you. <laughs> Ambassador Romulo, as soon as you get seated, and wrap, it's, it's all yours. <laughs> I will have to also be a policeman. I have to manage time. May I suggest that for three minutes each, each of our reactors can make, can react. And after that, they can continue to ask questions. And I also ask regarding uh, Secretary Ona, that the, those who want to have questions, uh, the, you may want to write it down and give it to Ernie, Faye. to Faye. Where is Faye? <coughs> there, okay. And we will post it in the web and get answers accordingly if there isn't enough time. Uh, Dr. Ramil, may I ask you first to give any reactions to either Secretary Honor's comments or to uh, Dr. Cabral's uh, remarks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear friends, distinguished guests. Um, I am honored to be here to uh, express some thoughts and I guess opinions uh, on what um, is transpiring this afternoon, which I think is very informative uh, as we gather under some very trying circumstances in the Philippines. Um, two thoughts, before I react directly, two thoughts come to mind uh, in this very challenging times. Um, in terms of just what has happened in the recent past in the Philippines, um, when I think about the millions, you know, in, in um, the larger uh, literature on how people perceive disasters, there is a very interesting phenomenon, and that is that <coughs> if you are in the business of asking people to donate time, money, and their dedication to a cause like this one, you can show pe people pictures of millions of people being devastated, or you can show pictures to people of one single family being devastated. And it turns out that when you show people the stories, the narratives behind that one family, donations increase many fold than when you show them pictures of millions of homes being devastated. Now, why would that be? And I would argue that it's a question of how people feel human agency, the extent to which they feel that their efforts can make a difference uh, that's responsible for that effect. 
And when we see millions of people being devastated, it's far easier to sit back a bit and say someone else will help. Because after all, what could I do to help this huge, this huge calamity? Um, and so I urge everybody here not to think like that, but think about particular children, particular women, particular men who've been devastated in what's just happened. And the two things that spring to mind for me uh, at a time like this uh, are first, the, the natural human aspiration, dreams that children have, dreams that you and I have, dreams that all of us have, can very easily be shattered at a time like this. And um, secondly, we tap into or we wish to tap into uh, human resilience that will very much, that will sorely be needed in the days ahead. And I uh, believe the two um, Filipino words for that are hangat, for aspiration, and matibay, for resilience. Matibay? Matibay, okay. Um, so I, I, with just, I, I wanted to put that out there as a frame with which to think about and, and react to the discussion that we have just heard. And I guess I would say that the theme that um, permeated uh, uh, both the talks that we heard this afternoon was one of um, disparities. That yes, we know that times are uh, very challenging. The, the mortality rate, the you know, so many other indicators give us pause about what's happening. But there is no denying that the disparity between that exists between the haves and the have-nots whether it is in the Philippines or whether it is right here in Washington, D.C., have exacerbated in the last 15 years, in the last 20 years. And unless we do something to address those disparities, then the uh, disparities in access to care, to treatment, uh, will continue to be exacerbated over the years. And I would assume that having in, in, um, in the talk um, that we heard earlier, uh, the theme of universal health care, uh, which we know has its own story in this country and its own set of challenges in a country as prosperous as ours, um, is a, a wonderfully noble desire in the Philippines. And the reproductive health bill certainly can go a long way in meeting those universal needs. So let me just stop you for a second, and then I'll uh, turn the mic over, and I can certainly talk to you on. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rimal. I would like to make a correction on my announcement. If you do give the questions to Faye now for Do uh, Secretary Ona, we will uh, send that via email, and he will answer accordingly. Ms. Hershey, would you like to make a comment, Ms. Good afternoon. There we go. Good afternoon. Um, I would also like to uh, thank you for um, inviting me to, to join the panel today. Um, I was the health officer of USAID Philippines for four years in Manila and just returned in June. And uh, it was one of the best four years of my life. And we're still, as my family says, we're still in Philippines withdrawal. And uh, my eight-year-old says every day, I want to go back. I want to go back to Manila. So anyway, it was a, a, a joy to work there and live there. And, um, and I was honored to be able to work with the staff of the Department of Health, uh, with Secretary Ona and with uh, Secretary Cabral and others. Um, what I wanted to do is just run through uh, briefly our, um, the USAID program in the Philippines. And as I do, I can respond to some of the comments uh, that were made by both Secretary Cabral and, uh, and Secretary Ona. Um, USAID's, health, USAID's assistance in the health sector in the Philippines goes back uh, decades. And uh, we've worked closely with the Department of Health in introducing child survival interventions such as ORS, routine immunization, vitamin A supplementation, uh, and others. And as we heard in Secretary um, Cabral's presentation, in former Secretary Cabral's presentation, that uh, really they're on track to achieve uh, the reduction of under five mortality. 
Um, and I think that's a major achievement. And I think one of the challenges going forward is just to sustain our gains in uh, child survival interventions, such as maintaining that uh, immunization rate. Um, we also helped create PhilHealth, introduced the field epidemiology training program, and have supported the development of uh, health reform agendas and policies uh, throughout the years. The program today uh, focuses on supporting the Department of Health's Universal Health Care Strategy, or Kalasugam Pangalahatan. And I think it's a testament to the leadership of the DOH uh, that, uh, that all the donors can know about KP, and most of them can pronounce it. So, <laughs> and uh, we're really all on board in terms of supporting the government, the three thrusts of universal health care, um, improving uh, health infrastructure, uh, financial risk protection, and the achievement of the MDGs. So it's an example of you know, a clear strategy put forth by the government to really improve the health of the Filipino people and also the emphasis on improving equity. So everyone does talk about the, the lack of access for the poor. And we're all um, donors included and, you know, and civil society and, and, and non-governmental organizations looking at how we can go that last mile to uh, really reach the vulnerable, to reach the JIDAs, which is one of my favorite acronyms, right? geographically isolated and uh, depressed areas, really trying to get to people who don't, haven't had services and need services. Um, so what we do is we, under, under this overarching, under the this overarching strategy of universal health care. We uh, provide technical assistance, training, materials and supplies, uh, really working with the Department of Health and not parallel, but, but working through the existing structures uh, to strengthen maternal and newborn health, family planning, tuberculosis, and HIV AIDS. And we focus on uh, supporting the Department of Health in terms of healthcare finance, particularly Phil Health enrollment, accreditation and utilization, uh, local government leadership and management, uh, and improved health data. Uh, it was uh, the USAID with the Department of Health and I believe the World Bank that supported the, the Family Health Survey of 2011, which showed that we really hadn't made the gains that we thought we were going to, had, that we should have made in reducing maternal mortality. So that was really an eye-opener, I think, that helped, uh, even helped advocate for the passage of the RH bill. And we work in 40 provinces closely with uh, all levels, central, regional, and local. Um, I think uh, one of the most important things that the government has done is, is promoted a, uh, a protocol, essential interpartum newborn care, and we are promoting uh, the scale up of that. It really looks at uh, preventing postpartum hemorrhage, one of the leading causes of death, um, during the delivery, and also uh, providing a key set of newborn interventions. So I think, again, one of the challenges going forward is we have a good protocol, we have good policies, but we really need to scale them up and make sure that they're implemented uh, in the way they were intended. And of course, in family planning, we support the DOH in its goal to increase access to quality family planning information services and products. Um, I think for many years we were working at the subnational level because the, there, wasn't, um, there was a focus on just uh, natural family planning at the national level. But I think there's a real opportunity with the current administration and we're really taking advantage and working closely with the Department of Health to, to, uh, to scale up access to FP. Um, and one of our strategies is to look at counseling, integrating FP into maternal and child care. Um, maternal, you know, antenatal care, postpartum care, and well child services. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's it. I just think that uh, it was a great summary by Dr. by Dr. Cabral and Secretary Ona. I completely agree with the challenges, and I think that it's it's really equity and uh, and quality that we have to look at going forward. Thank you. Perhaps the audience would like to have a question or two at this point. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank the organizers. Uh, my name is Vicky Navarro. I'm the president of the Philippine Nurses Association of America. And I'm Dr. Cabral, uh, Cabral thank you so much for that uh, presentation. We actually have a demonstration project that we are starting in Bacolod. And what we would like to do is to actually um, uh, educate more RN midwives. Because the RN midwife is actually a very important uh, role in the UK and in the Middle East. And with the uh, maternal and child health and the Planned Parenthood, a nurse, an a nurse is actually a lot more critical thinking 
than the midwives. I, I'm not saying that they're not qualified, but the education and training of a nurse allows her to do much more uh, better assessment. And um, gestational diabetes and preeclampsia, polyhydramnios, those are the causes of maternal uh, mortality. And so in addition to that, these RN midwives will actually train the midwives and the helots. And the helots. And uh, 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 for sustainability, we know that RN midwives, they will go somewhere after a while because the salary is not competitive. So we will need to go to the midwives, train the midwives on how to do uh, screening for uh, diabetes, how to take blood pressures, the helots as well. Our um, challenge is to get a grant for this program. So thank you so much. So, so you, you, your statement basically is midwives should be better trained in this yes. area. To, to, and to the question is how can we find the appropriate funds correct to, to do because, this? Because we are, be, yeah. all right. we are starting, we are partnering actually with a school in Bacolod and an NGO in the barangays. You're so, preaching to the converted and what we yes. need is people to support correct. that endeavor. Yes. Because first of all, we have we don't even have enough midwives. We have too many helots. All right. Yes, and actually, it's 17 midwives for 42,000 barangays That's good. in 2011. That was the uh, number in 2011. And the midwives should get along with each other, by the way. <laughs> yes. So thank you, and I hope that this uh, forum will actually help us get grant funding because PNAA, unfortunately, we don't have a track record for uh, having grants, so we are actually struggling to gra get grants, but it's a good program. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed. Right. Is there another question? Yes, ma'am. I'm Gloria Federiga and from McLean, Virginia. I'm Gloria Federiga and from McLean, Virginia. I have a brief question to Dr. Cabral. Thank you for the presentation, but I don't see any aspect in the presentation regarding the negative aspects of having um, this, um, what do you call this, uh, the RH. As we know, a lot of people are practicing liberal sex. Many people also are irresponsible in having sex, married or unmarried. I think that kind of uh, thinking and behavior should be also addressed when we have this RH bill discussions. Thank you very much. The reproductive health law in the Philippines addresses um, risky sexual behavior, if you will, as well as uh, values. There, these are all aspects of reproductive health. And in the Philippines, there is no argument about all the other aspects of rep reproductive health except for contraception. And that's the reason why that was the focus of my discussion. I don't think anybody can argue with prevention of sexually transmitted illnesses. I don't think anybody can argue about breastfeeding for infants. Nobody can argue that there should be male involvement in reproductive health. All of those things, the church, and the people who are advocating reproductive health agree on those things. It's only on contraception that they don't agree. Thank you very much, Dr. Kambral. Yes, ma'am. I'm Nina Reynoso Ray, and I'm a case manager and a member of the BNA. I work with Children's National Medical Center. And my uh, focus of, cons of interest is the uh, RH, does it cover sex education and have you included that in the school curriculum? Because I see 15 to 24 as one of the highest, the, the ages where there's a very high unwanted pregnancies. Now, with that being said, I'm a product of a Catholic school. I graduated, and I don't think taking OBGY and nursing, I don't think that was at all discussed during the time I was taking up nursing. So that being said, faith-based, Catholic schools, 
would be a challenge for you to include that in the curriculum. How would you handle this? Well, a lot of debate occurred on age and development appropriate sex education. And uh, what happened was age and development um, sexuality education as far as the RH law is concerned, is compulsory for public schools, but optional for private schools. We couldn't pass the reproductive health law if we did not make that compromise. But I agree with you that sexuality education is important and should start when children start thinking about uh, the birds and the bees, so to speak. So. I think there's time for one more question. Yes, sir. Dr. Jun Rasula, UPT Medical Alumni. Well, back in the Philippines, we have uh, cultural and religious differences. Up north, it's more a Catholic uh, predominance. But how do you deal down south when uh, they're non Catholics, when they're wary of uh, government attempts to control population? So, it, it one, at one, one program we did was uh, we tried to involve the female religious leaders teach them proper uh, birth uh, control and hygiene. And, but in terms of a government program, how do you deal with those non-Catholics? You will be glad to know that um, there were no objections from the Muslim area as far as reproductive health is concerned. In fact, the ARM region, the autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao, passed their own reproductive health law ahead of the Philippines. I'd like to thank Dr. Rimal and Anne Hershey uh, for participating in this. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Cabral once again. She is certainly the strongest advocate of reproductive health in the Philippines. And I hope she continues the fight and maybe beat up some of those Supreme Court people. <laughs> that so thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
ourselves. But if we come together, there is some hope for our mothers. And so it is with that mindset that we are approaching that. And uh, the reason we have, addressed, we have taken on this problem, maternal mortality, is very clearly that if we do nothing, in the next decade, it's estimated that nearly 3 million women will die from complications of pregnancy and childbirth. And please remember that most, if not all of the causes that are killing these women are preventable. In this side of the world, decisions on, on whether to paint the room pink or blue, where to deliver, what kind of a party to have, those are the questions that surround a childbirth, the happiness around a childbirth, whereas in many parts of the world, uh, they send the, their daughters and their wives and their sisters without knowing whether they'll see them again. So it's preventable, and yet this tragedy occurs. So the issue is, can we come together and do something about this? The reason a maternal death is devastating is because when a mother dies prematurely, it is not just her death. Very often, the children at home suffer, the child in the womb dies, the family dies, the community dies, the nation dies. They say when a mother bleeds to death, so does the nation. And even economically, women account for one third of the GNP of a nation. All the work they do in the house and, and in the farms, and if you were to add all that up. So it's not just the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do that without a strong mother in the house, there is no strong community or nation, both physically, mentally, and economically. Merck made a commitment two years ago that we would bring all of MSD to this problem. In addition, we pledged $500 million over the next 10 years. And we have pledged to work in partnership, and our partnership in the Philippines is a good example, and I'm, I've come here to represent that partnership. But basically, what my company has said is that we will, we will, um, we will uh, approach this problem bringing in all what Merck can do. And for a company like MSD Merck to be a successful pharma company, we need to know from end to end, we need to know consumers, how to change behavior, we need to know supply chains, we need to know pricing, we need to know policy, we need to know uh, how does the drug get from the bench of the scientist to the bedside of the patient. We know that, we do that for a living. The idea is can we bring this kind of mindset to a public health problem and join in partnership? We don't want to believe we can do it, so that is what we're trying to, uh, trying to establish here. We are, we are approaching it uh, by focusing on the two big killers. And the two big killers worldwide is postpartum hemorrhage and preeclampsia. Again, we know why they're dying, and we know how to save them. And Dr. Cabral, you'll be happy to know the third pillar is family planning and, and reproductive health. Because if you don't get pregnant, you won't die from it. <laughs> so we are focusing on, uh, on these three big uh, targets. And the way we're doing it is through innovation. This is what MSD knows best. Well, how can we bring the next game-changing innovation solutions? We also know that it's not enough to bring out, a, uh, bring out an innovation. We need to make sure the woman has the access to that at the time she needs it, where she needs it, when she needs it, at a price she can afford. And that is our access activity. And we also know the importance of advocacy, that 16 years of languishing of the of reproductive health uh, bill passed only because of the advocacy efforts that was done to make it come through. So advocacy is important. It's slow. It's a slow burn, but it's important to amplify what you're doing. So those are the ways we're doing it. We also are evaluating our programs in real time. London School uh, is working with us to evaluate the programs in real time. And we believe 80,000 Merck employees all over the world can bring a lot to bear on this. So that's what we're doing is all of Merck is coming in. So far, it's been two years since we've stay, take, taken off, and we are in 20 countries, uh, including the Philippines, I'm proud to say. 
This is my last slide. Uh, I am not going to get into the details of the program and the partnership because uh, I understand Ernesto Garilla will now uh, follow me and will give you an overview. But basically, we are, we are partnering with the Zulik Foundation and the Zulik Foundation strongly believes that if you have empowered and engaged local leaders who are, are technically and technologically um, supported, and who themselves take ownership and that we take the effort to train them and make them owners of this, that that is how you shift the, uh, shift the needle. And we tr truly believe and we are partnering with the Zulik Foundation in this kind of training of the local, local uh, governments and local leaders. Uh, in, and we've chosen a particularly difficult area in the Philippines and uh, Ernesto will talk about that also, I'm sure. And I'm happy to say we're getting some initial good read and some good results. I look forward to working on this project and I will leave it for Ernesto to talk about it. But I, I was hoping to bring to this group, uh, my closing rem remark would be the importance of making sure that the private sector joins that triangle uh, in these kind of efforts because there is something we can bring to the table. Uh, and in this instance, I think it's working well. Uh, time will tell. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. And uh, now we have Ambassador Romulo coming to the table, who is going to tell us about the Zulig family. And uh, this is a story that, a short story that must be told in order to understand why all of this is going on. Thank you. Okay. Why, you won't let me use it? All right. are and will continue to be for, uh, of our government. But I think part and parcel of that in terms of response, you need the private sector to be very much involved. I would suggest that what Merck has done is just the beginning together with the Zulik Family Foundation. You need more public-private partnerships. Secretary Ona discussed that. And public-private partnerships goes beyond just infrastructure. In what we're doing, the Zulig Family Foundation, of which, as you may have heard, I'm also the chair, although I'm known for other things. Uh, and, and it's extremely important. For me, who did come originally from the private sector, in many ways, the way I feel is government must enable, but it's the private sector should, that should implement it. And I think my country is starting to understand that situation. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rao. We really appreciate that. And, and before I, and I have 10 minutes, I, I will do a lot less, John, I promise you. Uh, the, the second point I wanted to emphasize is because of this regrettable disaster that we have today, uh, we, I, you know, I, we can go on and tell you everything about it, but the truth is CNN and NBC and ABC is covering it better than any of us could do it. However, within the context of our little portion of the Zulik Family Foundation, where we have um, adopted multiple municipalities, and now we're gonna work with the Secretary of Health for another 609 municipalities, our uh, feedback so far, although there's portions where we have no feedback, at least 10 municipalities that we deal with have been substantially affected and they need help in terms of rehabilitation and in terms of relief, meaning ability to feed and eat their fa feed their families. So. In that context, uh, uh, and uh, Professor Garila will cover this more, I just wanted to say, I hope you listen to his presentation on that part also, because we're talking about 40,000 um, uh, 40, households 
and 240,000 people. So, and that alone will require a substantial amount of money of something like $2 million just in that portion. So you multiply that with what you read in the newspapers, you can see the kind of challenges we have in that respect. Now, you've heard the name Zulig multiple times during this presentation, and it's a Zulig Family Foundation, and many of you may wonder, what is a, former, a foreign name like Zulig doing in the Philippines to begin with, and what on earth are they doing supporting a foundation? First things is the Zulik family started sometime at the beginning of the 20th century. And the Zulik Foundation, or rather the Zulik F.E. Zulik groups, effectively had its beginnings in 1901. And Dr. Stephen Zulig and Daniel Zulig, you hear from later, his father Gilbert, grew up and were born in the Philippines and been doing business there even during the war. So many may think they're, they're these foreigners, they're not just foreigners. They're Philippine born, they're Philippine citizens, and they're also Swiss by blood and citizenship. In this day of dual citizenship, let me just say, they've been very pertinent in the livelihood and in the Philippine society. And I'm personally involved with his uncle, Dr. Stu Stephen Zulik, who inter interestingly enough, is a very young 96 years old. And let me just suggest that he has done wondrous things for our country in many ways. So now in terms of the Zuli group, without belay belaboring the point, the reality is they are now a multinational corp corporation all over from Australia, New Zealand, all the way to India. And they have their worth in that respect. But in the context of the Zulig Family Foundation, they have multiple corporations. They have their own corporate and social responsibilities. But Dr. Stephen Zulig and Mr. Gilbert Zulig said, we owe a lot to the Philippines and we want to personally give our funds to support this family foundation. So it's separate and distinct from the CSR works of the various corporations. Again, thank you for joining us, but now let me give you a very brief video of what the Zulig Family Foundation is doing, followed by a very interesting presentation of Professor Ernesto Garilao. Thank you. Kikita na tayo. Parang kina ka ba ang kanay? Ramdam ko ang bilis ng tibok ng puso mo. I just imagine in 2009, ang Lapuyan ay merong six deaths, which is equivalent to 1,600 maternal mortality ratio. Marami nang napapahamag sa nanganganap. Ayoko mangyari yun sa akin, anak. Nagsisimula siguro ito sa realidad na I should own the problem. At kailangan natin magtrabaho sabay-sabay para masagot natin kung anong dapat natin magawa sa ating health dito sa ating munisipyo. Talagang walang masyadong nakatutok sa programa kasi ulang siguro ng personnel Minsan wala kaming medisina may bigay. Hindi pa masyado sigurado kung ang budget ko sa health ay talagang sapat. 
sa the whole year na pamamalakad. Dahil sa engagement ko po sa Zuelig Family Foundation, nakapag-initiate na po kami ng Barangay Health Board. At sila po yung nakatutok ng database collection at saka anong problema regarding health sa kanilang barangay. May dalaw kayo, Nay. Rinig ko ang ibang boses. Makananay siya, anak. Nagkaabang siya para siguro duhing ligtas ikaw at ako. Naisip kita, anak. Kaya nagpa-check up na ako. Siguro aware na po ang lahat ng mga tao na they should seek the health services sa ating mga health personnel na nagbigay sa kanila ng serbisyo. Kung okay ka lang, magiging okay lang ako. May sumusuporta sa atin dito. Marunong sila, anak. Magiging malusog tayo, anak, nang dahil sa kanila. Nangangailangan na makuha nila ang mga serbisyo na ito dahil ito po ay bigay natin sa kanila as basic services sa lahat ng mga local officials. RHQ po natin ay PhilHealth Accredited. Yan na naman na hindi akong pabigat sa'yo. Ikaw ang napapagaan sa buhay ko. Kakayanin naman natin ito. Inom ka palagi vitamins na ya para malakas ka at iwat sa sakit. Yung budget po sa health ay nag-i-increase po halos every year. Before we started with 7%, naging 13% na po. Meron na po tayong tatlong malalaking grupo. Isa ay RHU na nag-cater ng service delivery at dalawa sa Tiguha at saka sa Marwing. And they serve cluster barangays. Yung tatlong big groups ng service delivery ay may maternal shelter po tayo na pro-provide sa kanila. At saka yung shelter, expectant mothers could stay before and after delivery for a day or two. Nagpo-formulate na po kami ng ordinansa. Bawal ang mga anak sa bahay, dapat mga anak sa facilities. Mula sa mga health workers, pinuno ng barangay, hanggang mayor anak, pinangangalagaan nila tayo. Parang ang dami kong nino at ninang, nay. Dahil naging partner ko po ang Zueli, meron po kaming capability building, may mga modules na ginagawa, may workshop, at saka yung eye-opener po sa lahat ng health concern na kailangan pala dapat natin maisagawa sa ating bayan. Ang lahat ng training ay malaki pong tulong na naatin ang focus sa Millennium Development Goal. Kabuanan ko na anak. Sabi ko sabi ka kung makis kita na ay Malapit na tayo magkita. Marami akong natutunan. As a person, alam ko pala na magawa natin kung anong dapat gawin kung tutok lang tayo sa trabaho at saka sabay-sabay lahat po tayo in unity we stand at maagapan po natin ang mga problema. Just imagine in 2009, Lapuyan alone has six deaths, which is 1,600 maternal mortality ratio. And in 2011, we reduced it to zero maternal death. So it can be done, pala. Inaya natin, anak. Nakita din tayo sa wakas.
Now we have, as he comes to the podium, Ernesto Garilao, who is going to elaborate. <laughs> Thank you very much. The video you just saw gives you a clearer picture of what we at the Zwilig Family Foundation or ZFF do, for, do in rural health. And this, uh, the Zwilig initiatives in this area are guided by its firm belief that the key to improving the health situation among the poor is the local chief executive, that is the mayor. The mayor must be transformed into a health champion, one who fixes the system and makes health programs accessible to the poor and responsive to their needs. Only then can health outcomes improve. First, a brief background on CFF. As Chairman Romulo said, it started as a corporate foundation in 1997. In uh, 20, and in 2002, it focused on policy advocacy and training of health professionals. And sometime in, 20, in, in 2008, the foundation became the Zwilig family's vehicle for philanthropy. And as such, it had to settle the question of relevance and impact. Where could its resources be placed to ensure a critical point of leverage. Simply put, how can the work of the foundation make a real difference and lasting national impact? The family decided that it was in the health sector where its resources could best make a relevant and strategic contribution. For after all, the family's strength was clearly in the health sector where it had been in business for several decades. This was in 2008. And at that time, the devolution of health services from the national to the local government has been in effect for over a decade and a half. While well-intentioned, the devolution produced a fragmented health system. Municipal governments were in charge of primary health care the provincial governments look after curative hospital care, and the national government took charge of tertiary care and specialized hospitals. When the devolution took place, many local governments, especially those in poverty areas, were unprepared to take on the responsibilities. Mayors failed or simply did not know how to wield their authority and use their resources to create responsive health programs and services. And this led to health inequities that had dire consequences on the poor. And I think uh, the past speakers, in fact, mentioned that. The 2008 numbers noted the late former Secretary Alberto Romualdez underscored the serious disparities between the health outcomes of the rich and the poor. Those in high-income urban areas like Metro Manila, Cebu, and Davao had outcomes comparable to those in development, developed countries, while those in low-income rural areas had numbers closer to those in the least developed countries. For example, life expectancy at birth among people in rich areas was over 80 years. It was less than 60 in poor areas. Infants in poor areas were nine times more likely to die than those in rich areas. Likewise, maternal mortality, or MMR, was at least 150 per 100,000 live births in poor rural areas, and it was less than 15 in rich areas. And those in the, rich, in the richest quintile have the option of giving birth in a private facility, while 87% of the poor have only one option. In, 19, in 2008, to deliver at home, assisted primarily by a traditional birth attendant, making the mother at risk. 
Data in 2008 also showed that when seeking health care, 48% of the richest quintile went to private hospitals, 31% to private clinics. In contrast, over half of 50, or 53% of those in the pure, poorest quintile went to either the village health center or the rural health units of their municipalities. So essentially, the poor just went to the rural health unit, not to any private facility. These health inequities led the Zwilig Family Foundation to focus on the health of the rural poor, where relevant contributions can have strategic impact in terms of improvement of health outcomes across the country. It began formulating a strategy that was also aligned with the Millennium Development Goals on Health. What Zwilig Family what the Zwilig Family Foundation plan to do can be best summed up by what it calls the health change model, which is heavily influenced by a Marcia sense development as freedom. Health outcome is a function of people's access to health services. Just how responsive health services are is largely determined by existing institutional arrangements that, in turn, are made possible by a responsible leadership. Responsible leaders craft policies that make health services more accessible to the poor. The thesis of this health change model is that a transformed leadership would reform the existing health systems to address health inequities and produce better health outcomes of the poor. In building the capacities of health leaders, the foundation adopted the bridging leadership approach, specifically designed to address social inequities. At the core of this approach is the personal transformation of the mayor. The goal is for mayors to learn to connect their life's purpose to the quality of life indicators of their constituents. This interior transformation is deeper, more, per more personal, and has a more lasting impact. Personal ownership or owning the problem is therefore a necessary prerequisite before mayors can convince other health stakeholders of, of the need to address existing inequities. The Foundation's intervention involved a two-year four-module training with six months of practicum in between. During the training, the mayors and the municipal health officers are given structured learning exercises to help them become bridging leaders. During this practicum, they are given coaching and monitoring advice so that they can apply their competencies in bridging leadership to develop their local health systems. It is during this practicum when local governments work on reducing inequities. Here they are guided by the Municipal Health System Technical Roadmap, which was developed by ZFF based on the world's WHO's organ organization, Six Building Blocks of Health Systems Development. Each, block, each building block has a system of indicators the status of which serves as the basis for coaching and mentoring sessions of municipal health leaders. Between 2009 and 2012, ZFF piloted its health change model in three types of municipalities, which we organized as cohorts. The first type consists of low-income municipalities with high health burdens characterized as cohort one, two, and four. The second type are municipalities in the autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao, which are also low income, have a non-devolved setup, occasionally suffer from security disruptions, and whose Moro populations strongly adhere to traditional beliefs, cohort three. And the third type consists of municipalities 
located in geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas. Given its geography, there is very little access to health services. This type also has a high poverty rate with poor health-seeking behavior among its population. It also has security concerns. Building on the health, cha health change model, the ZFF was able to adjust its strategy based on insights culled from the experience in working with these municipalities, assessing those that produced positive incomes and were cost efficient. In the case of Lapuyan, the video that you just saw, an initial assessment based on the roadmap showed the majority of its health indicators were below the national standard. And this is it. Uh, I think one of the things that we ask the, the, the mayors to do is to really learn what the health system is all about, what are the different components of that system, uh, health and leadership, financing, uh, access to medicines, delivery of self health services, etc., etc. And here you have, they, they take a look at their health system. They make an assessment of where they are in terms of the indicators. And in the case of Lapuyan, when she did her assessment, it was basically all red. And that, in fact, was resulted in six, uh, 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 six uh, maternal deaths when she first started out. By the time she finished the course, her scorecard looked something like this. So, uh, so uh, essentially, they're now all green. They, she still has some reds to attend to. But this is the, this is the result of a, of a two-year uh, uh, practicum program wherein they have a better appreciation of the components of uh, the health system and start working on the indicators. And we always tell them, uh, you have to take a look at health as a system. Because if you want to, um, if you want to uh, uh, see to it that it's going to be sustainable, then you have to address the very, the, uh, the, uh, a lot of the indicators there. Uh, specifically, uh, leadership, uh, health leadership and governance, uh, information systems, uh, health financing, and the program especially on maternal health. Results like this have been encouraging, and the ZFF three cohorts that completed uh, the two-year program, these are our graduates, uh, have shown significant reduction in the MMR. Uh, and basically, uh, this is a sentinel indicator of the quality of health system. So the next one, uh, uh, when you take a look at, when we looked at their, their, their MMR, uh, starting uh, 165 uh, in 2010, uh, really dropped to 58 in 2011. Uh, by 2012, it's already below the target of 52. Uh, and so far, uh, in 2013, it is 49. And this is really the intervention in terms of health leadership and facilities-based deliver delivery. What is not imp uh, imputed here is the intervention on family planning. Uh, because we feel that if we improve the contraceptive prevalence rate, uh, the, the, you will have the possibility that uh, the, the drop, uh, uh, the, the MMR would uh, even go down. But the objective here is not really below 52, as Dr. Lozare was telling us. It is really zero. We always tell the, the governor, the, the mayors, that their target was that there should be no mother, no mother should, be, should die in my municipality as far as, uh, maternal, as, far as maternal deaths are concerned. Uh, <clears throat> now, what accounts for the good results? Uh, one factor that contributed to the good results is the foundation's practice of choosing municipalities with high health burdens, but whose leaders are committed to improving health systems. 
Uh, if you are not committed to uh, uh, improving your health system, uh, you're not part of this uh, particular cohort. Uh, because we feel that, that uh, 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 if, if the person is not committed, then no matter what interventions you will give him, he's not really going to work out. The other, the other, the other, um, the other um, uh, factor was that we ensured the delivery of effective training plus practicum. You train, but you have to do your deliverables during the practical period. And that's when you do the indicators. And, uh, and, um, and we continue to monitor the performance uh, and provide uh, uh, coaching and mentoring. So the foundation's approach is therefore not transactional. Uh, it is not a one-time engagement, uh, similar to implementing a specific project. Rather, it is transformational a long-term relationship because what needs to be fixed is a system and that it takes time. But MMR in cohort municipalities that have yet to, uh, to complete the program remain high. Uh, if you take a look at uh, cohort four and five, uh, they're still working out. Uh, cohort, cohort five uh, on the right-hand side is interesting because these are, these are mostly in Samar. And uh, these are the, um, these are the uh, uh, MMR of our uh, partnership with uh, Merck for Mothers. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, we were thinking because of the recent typhoon, unless, um, unless interventions are done, you re really would see the spiking of MMR. Uh, primarily because you see the breakdown of, uh, of uh, health systems, uh, the loss of uh, income sources, malnutrition for children, uh, infection, deaths, and with loss of income, uh, mothers don't anymore go to the rural health units. They just remain in their homes. The next step is we learn to simplify our approach. In 2010, we began to see improvements in the health system, and an opportunity was to develop a shorter and less expensive approach to our change model. And this was done through an agreement with the University of Makati, or UMAC, which piloted a simplified approach in an initial target of 20 out of the 300 sister cities of the city of Makati. And the results of the UMAC First two cohorts showed that MMR in batch one had fallen to zero as of end of September uh, of this year, but the batch two increase can be explained by the decrease in the number of live births despite the drop in death cases. Aside from the health outcomes, this program gave us valuable insights on how to simplify the approach without sacrificing the quality of training and outcomes. And based on these insights, the two-year program was reduced to one year. And unless absolutely necessary, ZFF staff did not conduct field visits. The coaching of mayors was done in Manila, and frequently they were in the area. And the monthly coaching of the municipal health officers was done over the phone. And these changes dramatically reduced the intervention costs. The foundation's experience with UMAC led to further adjustments and the use of the model resulting modified approach for expansion and replication of the model. The expansion of the scope of the health change model is done through partnerships uh, with UNFPA in uh, nine provinces, um, zeroing in on family planning, uh, with Merck Mothers for Health, uh, in 21 municipalities in Samar, uh, focusing on maternal health, uh, with USAID in uh, five provinces, including um, health plus tuberculosis. And discussions are ongoing on the United Nations Children's Fund for 36 municipalities. And I think when you take a look at it, a lot of uh, these partners really looked at uh, the role of local chief executives, the mayors and uh, provincial governors, 
uh, in fact, to own the health issues in their community. And once they own it, then they can modify their system accordingly and produce better health outcomes. In December 2012, the opportunity to reach the critical point of leverage came when Secretary uh, of Health Enrique Ona invited us to replicate the model in 609 poorest cities and municipalities in the Philippines. While there is top leadership support for this program, the replication strategy still faces some formidable challenges. And I think this is true for in, in, in development areas. When you start doing replication, wherein the mainstream institution now does the replication of uh, an approach uh, proven effective uh, in its pilot stage, then there are replication issues that, uh, that, uh, that have to be addressed. And the first is scale. The leap from 94 municipalities to 609 requires a different implementation modality. Ownership by the DOH bureaucracy requires institutionalization of the health and leadership governance program and its central and regional offices. Uh, and, and this program must be seen as an enhancer and not a competitor of existing programs. In other words, the bureaucracy itself must own the different approach. And if they own it, then what institutional arrangements can be worked within the program? Uh, the new arrangements also have to be accompanied by new skills in handling health and leadership. The DOH field personnel will serve as coaches, and the academic partners, regional academic partners, will now serve as training providers. So whereas before we were doing the training, now we move the training technology to the regional academic partners. So they themselves will do the training with the regional DOH. Incidentally, in this model, uh, the DOH uh, raised almost 800 million pesos for this program. Uh, none of the resources go to us. It goes directly uh, to cover the cost of the training and to cover, the, to cover their costs as well as the cost of the academic partners. Um, and the last factor to consider here is our own capacity to transfer the, the capacity building program and the training and the coaching competencies to both DOH and academic partners. And I think here uh, it, it's really a great opportunity because you have a, a private sector that has, that has, uh, uh, that has uh, proven a method that is accepted by the top leadership of DOH. And now the challenge is how do we now get the bureaucracy to do the new institutional arrangements that in fact would address that. Um, the, the, the next slide that uh, I will give you is that uh, we, we started 81 municipalities um, this year uh, that have undergone the first training. Uh, their collective MMR is 95. And we were telling Secretary Orna that, um, by, that he should be able to see changes in the movements by the second half of, 20, of 2014. Uh, everything considered. I mean, I mean uh, if the assumptions hold, uh, the rate will drop. And if the rate does not drop or does not drop accordingly, then you go back and take a look at the interventions and what should that be. Um, so that is the first uh, 609 municipalities, and that essentially uh, would largely will depend on the DOH capacity uh, to provide coaching during the practicum. Uh, as we told the secretary, in areas where DOH is prepared, the program will go fast, and the converse is true. Uh, looking ahead, uh, the next step that he asked us to do is to do the next set of 624 municipalities. And that, was, that is the original reason why we're having this forum. Uh, you have a briefer there that gives you an idea of the funding requirements for which uh, 8.4 million will be raised for the program. And we hope that uh, you will consider this. Uh, the relationship between DOH, CFF, and the academic institutions show how existing challenges can be addressed by public-private partnerships co-owning the issues 
and co-creating the strategic interventions in the spirit of trust and collaboration. And these new arrangements will result, hope, uh, will result in better health, health, outcome, health outcomes. And we have no doubt that it will. My last slide is really about the typhoon. I think you've seen this. Uh, we took this from, from, um, from Washington Post. Uh, you, you see the band, the, 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 the dark band there, which is really the, uh, where, where the, the, where, where the uh, typhoon went through. And, uh, and uh, we have proponents, uh, 14 municipalities in summer, uh, two municipalities. Zero maternal mortality for the past four years. You know, they, they were doing, but but you know, with, with that, um, with that, you just have to, you have to. Uh, what would be the interventions that would uh, that would prevent the spike? Because in a in a disaster situation, you would really know that that uh, the, the the maternal mortality will spike. Um, we have not heard from Romblon. Uh, we have not heard from Asbate down there. Uh, and I think two municipalities will be affected uh, somewhere here uh, because that's Agutaya and Magsaysay. And uh, uh, if, uh, if there was a storm surge, you know, they would have been quite. But the more problematic uh, area is really Samar. And I think the more, the, the, the major ones there are really at south of Samar, uh, three in eastern Visayas, because that was the first landfall uh, before it moved over to Tacloban. Uh, and then it went through uh, western Samar, uh, you have here. Uh, and the thing about western Samar is that the health uh, system uh, is not in place. Uh, western Samar is notorious uh, for bad uh, governance. <laughs> Uh, and really did not take care of its referral hospitals. And the referral hospitals, uh, uh, since the referral hospitals were not in, uh, in order, they in fact went to Tacloban uh, for emergency uh, obst ob obstetrics care. And the facility in, Sam uh, in Tacloban in fact was destroyed. So you so 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 uh, in a sense you have to take a look at that area and you say all right if the Tacloban is no longer uh, operable where do the mothers go and unless those interventions are going to uh, to 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 be attended to then you will see the spike and I think our challenge really is to see to it that uh, the interventions is done and um, and to see to it that the systems is taken care of. So with that, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Garilao. Everyone can see how what Zulig Family Foundation does and ties into what the typhoon rendered. Uh, the second open forum will now begin. Ambassador Romulo, will you come up, please? And uh, he will be joined by our second set of panelists, Mr. Basil Safi, Head for Asia, and Mr. Matthew Lynch, Director for Global Program on Malaria, with the Center for Communication Programs of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And Dr. Rao and Professor Garilao will also join the panel. So this is a, a rich panel. And Ambassador Romulo, as soon as you get your people seated, we will begin. Ambassador Quisier, you. <laughs> I was going to make further comments, but we'd go over time, so let me just keep my mouth shut and, and turn over, uh, begin with comments from my right was from uh, Dr. Lynch. And then after that, I'll ask for comments from Mr. Safi, and then questions will follow. 
Thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. Um, so I, I will keep my comments very, very brief. Um, it's really a pleasure to follow a talk as comprehensive as Professor Gary Lau's because really he covered it all, and there's not a whole lot else that needs to be said. I did just want to emphasize a couple of points that he made that I think have broad applicability um, across the developing world as well as in the Philippines. I think the importance of private sector partnership, pub public private partnerships, is hard to overemphasize. It really is an incredible confluence of capacities merging what the private sector can do in terms of supply chains and planning with the public sector responsibilities and ability to direct subsidies and uh, civil society's ability to uh, mediate that role with the general public. is It's very, very powerful. Um, one key point that I wanted to make that is a key issue right now in the malaria world is the importance of local level data. Um, I cannot say how important it is in empowering these local level government officials with not only the ability to collect data, but the capacity to analyze that data and use it for planning. It's incredibly powerful. I think we will see that in terms not only of the maternal mortality and, and some of the other indicators, but I also think we'll see that in terms of the impact of the typhoon because local mayors who are used to looking at the situation, analyzing it in a rational manner, and then using that data to make decisions are going to deal with the impact of the catastrophe much more effectively than those who are not. So uh, my congratulations to all involved. Uh, this is a, a remarkable program. Thank you, Dr. Lynch. Mr. Safi. I'd like to thank everybody for, for inviting me to, uh, today. I've, I've enjoyed this afternoon's sessions, and I, in some ways I think I represent the, the multiculturalism of the Zulig Foundation as a, as, a, as a passport holder from three different places. So I welcome, I will welcome this, uh, this international group. Um, when uh, Dr. Rao was speaking about the Golden Triangle, I think um, implicit to what he was stating is that the mother who's pregnant, the, the mother we've all been talking about today, is really sits at the center of the golden uh, of the golden triangle. And when we talk about innovation, access, advocacy, and the context of what President uh, Ernesto mentioned in the health change model, really what we're talking about is capacity, capacity for change. And I think when we think about that individual level change, um, a lot of emphasis is put on the system around that individual, that system around that mother. Um, but really the first line of defense in many cases is changing health, uh, health behavior at the household level. Because health-seeking health behavior is often the first, the first pivot point through which all these things are possible. So um, when we think about capacity, we must think about it at an individual level for those household members, for that woman and the people who surround her, um, at the organizational level and helping uh, leadership to pursue sometimes unpopular agendas, as we heard through the reproductive health agenda in the Philippines today, and also to encourage uh, you know, um, lawmakers and citizens to see the value of that change within the system. And certainly when you look at the interaction of the, the, the public sector, the private sector, and, um, and civil society, we see that at the heart of this lies an ability to, uh, to, to, to rally around a key issue. And, and keep that the, the pregnant woman in, in our hearts and minds throughout this. And I think a good example of that capacity is actually a, a project that Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs is engaged in now in the Philippines with the generous support of, of USAID and, and the Ministry of Health, where we're really looking at capacity across these various systems. Um, and Anne and I were just speaking during the break and um, come to know that we are a subcontractor to a, to a private sector firm in, in Philippines called Campaigns in Gray. Mm -hmm which in the 90s actually served as, a sub, uh, served as a subcontractor to Johns Hopkins CCP. Now we're working with them on this, on this multi-year USD project to, to, to build capacity among the local health workforce at all levels of government. So um, I'd like to applaud the group today and, and, and the efforts um, towards maternal and child health in, in Philippines, and um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Safi. I, I think both our commentators have given us a little more food for thought, but I think at this point, perhaps there would be questions from the audience for the two main speakers here. Please. Yes, sir. Thank you for this uh, great forum. I'm, uh, 
I am Dr. Cabellian of the uh, University of the Philippines Medical Alumni Society. We do uh, do some uh, help also in the Philippines, but uh, the big question that I have f for Dr. Gar Garland, I believe, is that how much of an additional investment in terms of money, in terms of personnel, in terms of knowledge did you have to invest in the one factor of trying to make a dent on, mater on maternal mortality? You know, health is not just maternal mortality. There is dengue, there is malaria, there is cancer, there is cardiovascular disease. So this is one aspect. And if I were the mayor of a town in the Philippines, this is a big headache. Uh, the, the intervention that we have, our, our, our direct cost goes around uh, half, uh, half a million pesos, uh, including the training and uh, the modules. Uh, when we did the uh, University of Makati, we were able, to, the, the uh, intervention cost actually went down uh, to around 75,000 uh, because uh, other institutions uh, pick, up, uh, uh, pick up the costs. Uh, but I think the, 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 the payoff there is that, in fact, they will put in more resources, more local resources for health. Uh, for instance, in the case of um, of Lapuyan, she moved from six uh, to thirteen percent, and we really want to move them to uh, thirteen to fifteen percent. And when they have that kind of expenditures, uh, basically they would do the uh, they, they would cover the basics. Uh, one thing that we also knew was that when you try to get them to concentrate on all the facets. Uh, it's too much for them to handle at one time. So in other words, do MMR, IMR, TB, dengue, malaria, etc., etc. Uh, they, they, they get overwhelmed. But, uh, but uh, in a sense, you ask them to do what goes first. And the first really goes maternal, uh, uh, MMR and IMR. And once they have gone through that system, then they look, take a closer look on uh, uh, infectious diseases, and even now they are looking at non-infectious diseases. Uh, so when you take a look at cost, uh, and, that, and I think that's why in, in my presentation I said,